Kia ora and welcome to the Niggly Niche Cast. It's your boy, the Niggly Dude, uh, Doc, Mr. Papatai Panther, here with the Wobbly Wild Card for another episode of the Niche Cast. Coming to you, just wrapping up a bunch of Kiwi sporting matters. And today we have some Wellington Phoenix on the agenda. They are back. Rough loss for them in the A-League. We've also got a couple of Kiwis around the world. Bit of MLS, bit of Chris Wood on the agenda as well. We are wrapping up the latest in the NBL, the New Zealand NBL, which is in its final week before the playoffs. So we're going to talk about that for a wee bit. And we have some NRL to discuss as well. A couple debutants that caught my eye from Aotearoa were Dejan Asi making his debut for the Cowboys, and Jackson Polo making his debut for the Rabbitohs, and any other rugby league matters that tickle our fancy. So plenty of Kiwi sporting matters to discuss. Today, we've dropped our email newsletter, so if you want to read on some extra stuff, check that out as well. Jump on Patreon and support us up the guts as per usual. Wobbly wildcard, what's crack a lackin'? Yeah, what's crack a lacking? Um, well, I mean, if you want to start with some good old-fashioned weather chat, we had a belter of a weekend with the rain up north. I tell you what, there was um, I I read that the like the what do you call it the threshold for a severe re- um weather warning is when they reckon a hundred mils of rain is going to fall within a twenty-four hour period, and there were places in Whangarei and further north as well. Where like in excess of 220 mils fell over the course of a 12 hour period. So that's twice as much in half as long. Uh, pretty like severe floodings in a few places as well. Nowhere near me. I happen to live uphill. So it was all good. But yeah, man, got, um, got pretty hectic on Friday night. Bit of that, bit of that Jim Hickey weather reporting from the north. That's the one. That's the one. It indeed. was a one in 500 year storm, apparently, according to some people who made some very generic kind of like scientific assumptions about it all but still like you know uh, ex- extreme weather man you got to sort of uh step back and um you know as much as i wanted to play football on saturday it was pretty obvious that wasn't going to be happening or well, like shops were out there on saturday morning like mopping up their floors and things like that in town like sometimes you kind of just got to got to step back and let mother nature do her thing eh do a thing indeed and it's a fucking weird old time because you got you just keep hearing about how yeah it's raining in auckland but we need to save water so fucking hell sort your shit out if we got if we got rain falling from the sky how about we use it in an efficient manner yeah sounds like a pretty good idea like it sounds like a um sounds like a logical uh conclusion to take from all that i mean there was the the madness of it all is that it was a bloody like full-on drought for the first like three or four months of the of the year in northland like proper genuine drought like water shortages all over the show um water restrictions in place because of that it finally it's been pretty wet for the last couple months but then now like so like what probably three months after the end of a severe drought and there's like a one in 500 year um, like weather event with the rain going and then even then there was still water shortages for about 12 hours afterwards because there was so much rain that the water treatment facilities had drama trying to you know get through it all it was bloody mental like i don't know how you go from one extreme to the other within the course of the same year but maybe there's a little bit of a hint there as to people maybe you know not treating nature with the respect that they ought to the respect and the reverence that they ought to completely non-scientific speaking here but when i was in brisbane you could notice that the ground was a lot harder obviously drier conditions but you know quite tropical so in the summer it absolutely pissed down but because the ground was really hard the water just sat on top it like it was hard it was more difficult for the rain to seep into the soil and be absorbed because the the ground was rock hard rain would just hit that and it was kind of like guaranteed flood because you've got the dry conditions throughout the year, but then you get this tropical thunderstorms that just absolutely piss down, and then everything is just you know not prepared for um, monstrous rain, which is very different to New Zealand because when there's monstrous rain, it just turns into slop. Yeah, uh, there's a um, 
there's a Charles Eisenstein book that I read about um, about the climate, and it's called Climate Climate, a news story. It's called, um, and that well, was one of the things he talked about was about like well, the, um, the main theme of the book was trying to get people to change the sort of narrative about how they think about nature and to get people to treat it with more of a like sacred kind of um, just thinking rather than just like something you can exploit and um like a, just a resource that's there for you to do whatever you want with it like understanding there's consequences and you have to have that reverence for nature and but he went into a few different things about how like um the climate is altering around the world and that's one of those things is when things get drier and then you get those like um there are places where like it's been the, australia is a good example of that where it's been like that for thousands and thousands of years so like the the environment is used to that um Australia has some pretty mental kind of environmental um just even just things that happen naturally like the forest fires fires there are actually a part of like an ecosystem in a weird way but uh yeah certainly not meant to be as extreme as they were at the start of this year um but like drying out land is one of the things that's doing a lot of damage is like people chopping down trees trees don't um you know trees protect and filter that rain they hold it in the leaves they disperse it over time when the winds come through the um sort of foliage on the ground as well helps to absorb things it keeps um bugs and and small animals uh it, you know living in those conditions that helps as well all of this helps like turn the soil over and then when you get like big deforestation projects you get that as a result which then people aren't really thinking of they're just like oh we'll plant some more trees whatever but you take out the whole like canopy of a forest and suddenly like the ground is exposed to the sun it, it hardens up you get more flooding and stuff because of that as well like um i just, that's not the case for what we're talking about in Whangarei at the moment but like that is something that happens all over the world as well where there are places like australia where that's okay like the the nature has its own sort of natural infrastructure type whatever to to handle that and then there's places where it's like freshly done and suddenly the ground's getting baked and it's actually like destroying the the nutrients of the topsoils which damages um you know um farmlands and things like that and just oh it's, it's just a weird old kind of rabbit hole eh? we probably don't need to go any deeper on this but just the ways like the little domino effects from people thinking that this one decision is okay because whatever we're going to plant some more trees or something and they're not realizing like just everything that comes from that and just the damage people are doing to the planet eh? by, by not even thinking about these things, by not thinking with a sort of holistic view of, um, you know, Mother Nature. Shout out Mother Nature and shout out to local sport wildcard. Uh, usually on the Saturdays you're, you're involved in your own local, your local football. I am making an effort just to get around the grounds, around the grounds in Auckland. And this Saturday I went to watch a bit of rugby league. You had Point Chevalier Pirates playing Richmond. I think they're the Richmond Rovers. And oh, to a lesser extent in the Auckland rugby competition. Again, I'm well, we're both from Auckland, but I'm in Auckland. And so there's heavily heavy Auckland-centric bias here. Um, but in the Auckland rugby competition, there's less of this. But you can still get out and see... Like a Nico Jones is playing for White Matter, I think it is. So if you are a bit of a rugby nerd and you want to sc scope out some premier young talent, someone like Nico Jones is running around in the Auckland competition, and it'll be interesting to hear or just see, you know, what notable players are playing in Wellington and Christchurch and these big hubs. Um, but in rugby league, because there is no, there's nothing else except for NRL at the moment. So You've got the Warriors Juniors, they're playing in the local Auckland competition. So, you know, um, not quite reserve grade because a lot of their top 30 is with the Warriors over in Australia. But, you know, you're talking under 20s and younger and more fringe players. They're all playing in the local competition. Um, they have to play for the top clubs because the Warriors makes them play Fox Memorial, which is like the premier competition. So they have to leave their... It's a it's a rort in the Auckland Rugby League competition. Like you've got three or four clubs who just have the most resources and they get the best players and they also have the relationship with the Warriors to, you know, get the Warriors juniors to leave like a Odahuhu or leave like a Mangari East or Alice the Eagles or Pakaranga Jaguars to go join your point shares, Glenoras and Richmonds. 
nonetheless, you also have a lot of players who were meant to play in the Queensland Reserve Grade competition or the New South Wales competition, Reserve Grade competition, more specifically the Queensland competition because a lot of players weren't aligned with an NRL club. So they, a couple, you know, four or five got signed over the summer to go play in the Queensland Reserve Grade competition with no NRL connection. That competition scratched, so they're actually back in Auckland playing in the Auckland competition. So very interesting. Like you had, I was watching uh, a young Warriors forward, Jairus Glamazina. I think you also had Temple Kalepo was playing at hooker as well um so there's a lot of interesting talent in that you know Auckland rugby league competition where it's a it's a bit stronger than usual because you don't have just the local club battlers and a sprinkling of like warriors contracted players you've got a bunch of players from australian reserve grade clubs who have come back to Auckland and are playing in Auckland so i went out and watched a bit of that uh point chev versus richmond was very interesting and very i love you love being at the ground because then you can hear a bit of the shit talking as well um there's a warriors reserve grade player set two who's played on the wing i think he actually played for the a trial for the warriors earlier this season pre-season he was playing at fullback for richmond and then just hearing stuff like one of the point chef players you know yelling out it's the set two show it's the set two show and just hearing that little bit of niggle in the local you know local sports was uh beautiful so gonna try and get around the grounds and see a bit more of that um is there any you got any little little local footy notes that you want to chuck in well yeah i mean i can chuck out just on carrying on that theme it's a pretty similar case with the um with the football scene like the club football scene in new zealand at the moment as well like in particular, the two strongest regions, which is, you know, the Central League and the um, Northern Premier League. But, like, just the, I mean, the, like, I was looking at the I, out of town. I can't go watching any of these. And if even if, like, um suppose I could catch a, a Northland game, they're Div 2. Um, but still, but, I mean, I'm playing myself on Saturday, so it's not really um, on the cards, personally. But, like, just looking at the, the team sheet for, um, so Central played Eastern Suburbs, um on saturday it must have been and it was just like national league players stacked throughout eh? like central was just three quarters of the um auckland city squad and and you've got like um that auckland united things up now which is uh three kings and only hunger sports merging so that's a pretty like stacked team as well um you know uh, old manikau chipping in with a good win on the weekend i'm pretty sure as well they got a real intimidating looking forward line um just like the the ability i mean obviously if you look at like western suburbs um down the central league and um uh, you know like napier city rovers and a few of those other teams like just the standard the quality of players that are available like guys who wouldn't necessarily play ordinarily like guys who might be in town but not playing um club football during the winter maybe have done because it's a slightly shorter season or whatever or just guys who would ordinarily be have like flown over to australia to play um state leagues or something around this time of the year as well like they're not there at the moment so there's just a it's as stacked as you're ever going to see it um and part of that as well is also because there's just like um this club level is where you get a lot of like that sort of while they're still teenagers a lot of those quality players coming through like ole academy obviously playing out of Western suburbs have always got a young and extremely talented team and like you got the Phoenix dudes and um you got like several of those academy type things um going on and like the eastern suburbs one for example in Auckland is pretty strong they've always got a good lot of young players so there's that like there's this rising um core of like talented young players a lot of whom have gotten a fair bit of national league experience over the last year or two um some of whom are coming into that time themselves but you've also got like guys who would otherwise just be elsewhere um maybe earning a little bit of cash for their money playing semi-pro in australia or something around this time or whatever like there's just the for um a combined reason and it's all i guess pandemic related really but there's just a the quality on show right now and um and and well in new zealand club football really is is as high as it's gonna is as high as it's been for several years and as high as it's gonna be for several more years as well so it's a bit of a 
short little golden window as well to catch some of these guys see, like playing in what's basically like local football, you know, down the park. It's hard to say for certain because there are there have been some like massive defeats and there's a disparity between the top and bottom specifically in the Auckland Rugby League competition so I don't want to say like it's a little purple patch for local you know sports in Aotearoa but if you want to get out and see some you know professionals or semi-pros playing at the club level in New Zealand now is the best time to do it and to just go to reinforce this point so Richmond Rovers had Setu 2 who's with the Warriors, Edward Kosi, uh, was playing reserve grade for the Warriors last season. you got Michael Lamafa at prop for the Richmond Rovers. He he was a Jersey flag prop last season. Temple Kalepo at hooker, Jairus Glamozina as well. They were all Jersey flag last season. And I think they were named for like round one reserve grade this season as well. And then on the Pirates, Bo Quartz has spent time he, he, he was at fullback for the Pirates. He spent time, I think, in both Queensland and New South Wales competitions, reserve grade competitions. Harley Maynard was a Jersey flag player for the Warriors last year. Cody Opori Pukatapu. He was meant to be playing reserve grade in Queensland this year. Um, so he's from New Zealand. And then I think he was like in a wider Broncos kind of system for this year, but... No reserve grade in Queensland, so he's back in Auckland. Api Peparangi, back on the Auckland scene um, after his international travels. And Pat Sipley's playing for the Point Chev Pirates. He's been around NRL clubs. Philip Makatoa is a Warriors reserve grade player by now as well. So two teams with plenty of like fringe NRL or NRL system talent. Um, so if you do like rugby league, jump down. If you do like football, jump down to your local park. Like It's not even about supporting a team that's what i find it's just about watching talent and watching talent up close and personal in a you know typical kiwi environment where you got your shoes getting a bit muddy and you can hear a bit of sledging and a bit of shit talking and you can you know when you're watching a rugby game or a club rugby game or a club rugby league game you're, you're feeling the contact and you're feeling the challenges in a football game as well because it's right there but everything's at a higher pace. The bodies are more athletic and uh, more physical and just more talented. So you can, everything's a bit, bit enhanced, isn't it, Wildcat? Yeah, when you can get like right up there to be able to hear what like coaches are yelling out as well is another thing. Like not just the, um, not just the niggle going on with the chat between like players, but actually hearing like instructions coming from the sideline and stuff as well. And um, being able to hear the contact and all that, it's, uh, it's just a, it's an element that you don't get other like anywhere else, eh? Because um, I mean, you're not going to see it to that level watching U Sport or whatever, because you're not talking about fully grown adults playing. Um, but you're also not going to get it at like even um, even like on a national league scale, because you, if you're watching, you're probably in a stadium. You're a bit further back. You might like. You, there's certainly some sports where you would in a few grounds. Um, like I think this is certainly you can get this in National League football um, at most of the grounds. We can get nice and close down on the sideline or you know a couple meters back from the sideline. Um, but yeah, there's just a different it's a different feel to the sport that you certainly would never get on TV and just another element to, to why you know we I guess why we love these things, eh? But I am sure the Wellington Phoenix wildcard will start here and. Like personally, as a more casual Wellington Phoenix fan and just someone who follows sports closely and is always tuned into what's happening in different sports, I have zero interest in learning about the referee decisions or the VA, the lack of VAR. That is that holds no interest for me. You've actually done a fantastic breakdown of it um, in your written thingy magic about the Wellington Phoenix. Losing to Sydney FC 3-1, I believe it was. So we'll just bypass the VAR and the referee decisions and focus on the Wellington Phoenix coming back, A-League restart. The referee stuff may have had a big or dramatic or whatever impact on the game, but the, the value here is learning how the Wellington Phoenix are playing, what they're doing, notable players, and 
just setting the scene for the remainder of the A-League season in which you're rather where you're rather hopeful that the Wellington Phoenix can make some serious waves in the um, remaining five or six games. They're currently third after that loss to Sydney FC. Next week, they're playing Perth Glory, who are fifth. Just in simple terms, what do you make of the Phoenix's performance? Was there kind of like the post-pandemic rust? They've been away. They've been in Australia. So did you see any, like, was it a slow start? Was it a slick start? How did you assess the Wellington Phoenix coming back, first game back? They lost 3-1, but what was your vibe with their performance, their efforts, and how they operated? Yeah, they lost 3-1, but they lost 3-1 to the top team who were going to be finishing top regardless. Like, they Sydney just aren't going to slip up enough for anyone to be able to catch them, not the Phoenix, not anyone else. So, like, di- like disappointing that they didn't get a win because they did enough, to like they were winning with 15 minutes to go. There were some sneaky, weird... Uh, it's not that the decisions were weird. I think they're all justifiable in their own right by a referee, but um, the weird thing was that they've decided not to have VAR for the rest of the regular season, at least, um, which is exactly what we're saying we won't talk about, because I think that... I think if there was VAR, there's just... The VAR seems to... It's not about right or wrong decisions anyway. It's about the VAR just rules differently than a referee would and real time make like getting to see things once whatever so it's i mean suffice to say it's just a bit of a league shenanigans that they've changed the way the game is ruled basically at that point and that's had a decent impact on the result you'd have to say but um not only should we disregard really the var stuff we should also disregard the result i think because the as i was saying like the result doesn't make a huge difference to the table like the phoenix still have it very much in their own hands to finish second. This was a little bit of a bonus game, like and a statement of intent as well to be able to play against um, the t- championship favorites and show what they can do. And um, okay, they didn't get the victory, but like again, disregard the result. Look at the performance. They did enough to say that they can contend with a team like this. They did enough to show that they're going to contend for the rest of the season, um, specifically against you know the playing things out against teams who won't be as good as the Sydney team were. I think it's pretty clear, like, just the way the dice have kind of fallen, that um, the Phoenix and Sydney, who were already looking like the two informed teams when the when the pandemic hit and the league went on hiatus, I think that game probably proved that they remain the two most um, informed competitive teams. And uh, just even just looking at the way things have fallen for everyone else, like, um, Perth Glory don't have Diego Castro, for example. Um, Ola Toivonen's left Melbourne Victory. Like, there's other teams just seem to have been weakened by this, whereas the Phoenix have come back, um, Sydney as well. Sydney have come back expecting to win a championship, expecting to win the Premier Plate, expecting to lift the trophy at the end of it. Um, so they're obviously on a bit of a mission themselves, but the Phoenix are the same. Like, the Phoenix have come back, all their players are there, full buy-in from everyone. They've had to do the quarantine thing twice now, so they're, they're a little bit used to it, but it also shows, like, the dedication and the belief that this team might be able to do something special, and I'm calling it the, the Welly Knicks title quest. I'm gonna title all my Phoenix match reports with that from, from now on, because I fully believe that um, I'm not saying they will win the championship. That's a lot to ask to beat a team like Sydney. But I am saying that they, I think they're the second best team right now. And I think that's worth, like, rather than um, knocking on wood and playing it cautious, I think it's worth being, like, um, celebrating that fact and saying the Phoenix are on course for their best ever finish in a regular season. They've got the best ever chance they'll have to make a shot at it, like, to make a grand final to actually play for an A-League championship. And I think that's, yeah, I think that's something to celebrate. I think that's something to um, enjoy the entire process of, not just sort of like um, being afraid to jinx anything or whatever. This team is beyond that. This team is a strong team. They're going to get better um, with a few more games under their belt. I think that was one of the notable things that they didn't finish that game particularly well. You know, 1-0 up with 15 minutes to go, ended up losing 3-1 to one well, one of the penalties, whatever, um, it was a penalty, but it was also an awkward one, which uh, maybe Ulysses De Villa in mid-season form wouldn't have been so silly as to leave his arm there for the ball to roll up off his chest um, under no pressure or whatever. And then maybe, um, you know, those two counter-attacking goals wouldn't have been conceded if Matty Steinman was still on the field, perhaps, or 
just if the team was a little bit sharper and like those kind of things are going to happen in the first game back after a long break but what I saw from them they basically just picked up where they left off you know the, there wasn't any distinctive change in the in the intent or the style of how they were trying to play football they were entertaining they were nice and fluid they were getting their fullbacks forward and um, Libby Kakache had a very good game Louis Fenton had a very good game as well which Fenton's one is even more important because we know what Kakache can do um, as for Fenton he's gonna have the next three starts in a row after this as well he's coming back from a long-term injury uh, we needed to see something like that his fitness was good his performance overall was pretty good um, didn't get caught out at the back or anything was you know nice and keen getting forward swinging crosses into the box just what we want to see from him while Tim Payne is out suspended and maybe he'll even make a case to start beyond that but um, the one thing that was probably missing was a little bit of fluency in the attacking third but I think that's pretty easily written off by the fact that um, Ulysses De Villa and Gary Hooper both started on the bench um, that was the first time De Villa's played off the bench all season, and I'm reminded of his debut for the club, where first game of the season he looked pretty rusty, he got caught on um, possession a few times, um, just not quite up with the pace of play, and then from like the second game onwards until this point, he basically has been like Johnny Warren medal contention form. He's been outstanding. Uh, that like. If it took him that one game just to just to get up with scratch the first time, it makes sense it might take him a game to get up to scratch the second time, which is why I think it's perfectly understandable that he started on the bench. I think it's also why we won't see him start on the bench again throughout the rest of the season unless it comes time to rest players. Uh, and Gary Hooper, we have seen him do very well off the bench in cameos throughout the season so far. Um, but at the same time, we've also seen the Phoenix probably at their best when they've got that Hooper-Ball combination up front. Uh, David Ball, probably not a coincidence then. Very quiet game from him against Sydney. Uh, just didn't see a whole lot from him. Um, but yeah, I think once uh, Hooper might take a little bit longer because he obviously is less of a... I mean, he took some time to get fit in the first place before the pandemic when he first turned up as well so I don't I don't know what the um, immediate sort of uh, diagnosis will be for him maybe he'll play off the bench for a few games until he gets his legs uh, maybe he'll just be straight in there and see what he can do um, but the like when those two are playing more prominent bigger minutes um, more prominent roles on the park I think you'll see the Phoenix looking like they can score goals a little bit more effectively than they did against Sydney FC. And I think once you've got that going, um, you've got you've, you've got full capacity Wellington Phoenix, basically. And that's that's what can lead them down the old uh, Welly, Welly Next title quest road. So um, result, not what we would have liked. It would have been pretty cool to get a nice statement win against the, against the um, inevitable premiers. But at the same time, I think like just on a slightly deeper level we saw everything that we needed to see from the phoenix to legitimize the fact that this is a team that has the ability to go deep in the playoffs and that's exactly what we ought to be uh hoping for and expecting from them to be honest that's why someone like alex rufa was pretty damn good he had he was the only non-phoenix defender to have a passing accuracy over 90 percent he also created a couple chances as per the a-league stats and that's having 94 passing 94 percent passing accuracy on 51 passes is pretty good like if you're doing that many passes and you're completing them at a high rate you're holding on to position but then it's also his physicality in the midfield wild card is also notable He's always ripping in. He's always, you know, he's never shy to go into a challenge and, and win the ball. Someone like Rufa in that midfield, is that is that something you can build around? Like, especially as he's a bit younger and he's got the physicality, he's got the passing, he's everywhere. Just having, like, that that's kind of stuff reminds me of someone like Albert Riera, where... You've all, you've got someone you've got a fulcrum in the midfield to build around that does both duties. So it's all it's all good to have someone super slick, super attacking, always moving the footy. But if they're not there defensively, you can't build. You can, there's simply not a fulcrum that you can build around in that midfield. How do you view Alex Rufrin? Like 
was he a standout with the eye test as well with that regard? He certainly was for me. I thought he had a, an outstanding game. I thought that it was just like, it was it was prime roofer, basically. It's exactly what you want to see from Alex Roofer. He was um, doing all those things you said. He was passing the ball around nicely. He was, um, and it's not just like little sideways passes as well. One of the things he's quite good at is that sort of um, inlet pass into a striker's feet, like just pushing the ball nice and firm towards the striker, get the ball in the attack in third, see what happens. Um, taken, it's a little bit of a risk because you're putting the ball in an area where there's a lot more defenders, but it's also the kind of thing that can be an impetus, get a few like little one-touch passes going on the back of that, um, make a run following on your pass and those kind of things. It's helping, it's being proactive, it's helping make things happen. So he's not just like a big physical defensive presence, which is something he's also very good at. Um, always likes a yellow card, that fella. He throws himself around a fair bit, um, not shy of conceding a foul or two, which is, you you know, you want that from a midfielder. You want someone who can break up um, possessions from the other team, even if you're not winning the ball, at least, like, stop them and make them restart from a free kick or something. Um, so I thought he had an excellent game. Um, one of those shots that he had as well was the one that hit Ryan Grant on the arm, which maybe could have been a penalty. I don't think it should have been a penalty. But I also think that if there was a VAR in place, they probably it's the kind of handball they would have given. Um, but anyway, uh, the the thing that was so impressive about Rufus' performance, though, is that he was in the same position as Louis Fenton. Like he probably wouldn't have been starting; he would have played. Um, he would have come off the bench for sure. Um, but he maybe wouldn't have been starting had Cam Devlin not been suspended. He had to sit out because he had you know picked up his fifth yellow card in the previous game which was like four months ago but whatever um long wait for him to get that suspension out of the way but because of that like in comes Rufa and Rufa puts in the kind of performance that demands like further selection so now um if he's got a bit of a a bit of a headache to him like do he does he go back immediately to Cam Devlin does he ride out this Alex Rufa thing does this mean he can rest Matty Steinman um and ease him in uh, maybe only give him 60 minutes or something against Perth so he can get his legs under him again as well. I don't know. Like you got a lot of um, you got a lot of options. I expect you'll see probably Devlin will come back in to start because Devlin just does offer a slightly more uh, what would you call it like dynamic presence in the midfield next to someone like Matty Steinman who's already sort of doing a similar role to what um, Alex Rufa does. So like whether it means he's gonna continue to start every game because he played an excellent game here probably not but I mean this is exactly what you want to see as a player who given an opportunity demands further opportunities it's what Louis Fenton did at right back at a time when we really needed him to as well because there's not a huge amount of depth at right back um, with pain out suspended at the moment so it's also something I guess you'd have to say like um, I think Ollie Sale's done a very good job of that, and he hasn't played at all this season, but last season he had about three or four opportunities to play and did very well in most of them. Like, um, It's the kind of thing you want to see in a strong squad because it shows that you're not just a first 11 kind of team. You're a team that has depth, you've got competition for places, you've got all those things, and I think Rufa and also Fenton made a pretty good showing of those two things as well, and Fenton might also... Um, like come to think of it, if if Liberato Kakache does end up having to leave mid season to um to sign with the European team, as is like the the whispers of that are only getting louder and louder at the moment. If he does leave, I don't know that there's a natural left back replacement at the club, so perhaps it means someone like Fenton or Payne, um, one of them might just have to switch to the left and say, Okay, I'm not left footed, but we'll do what we can here. Um so hey like there's there's opportunities that are consistently arising within a squad over a season as more suspensions will happen more injuries will happen you know there's this short sort of turnaround i mean the next game is on wednesday night against perth so there's like injuries are going to be a part of that not just injuries but also rotation and making sure people stay um you know don't get exhausted just with the short turnarounds between games so opportunities will arise the depth is not going to need to be um tested in that way and to see already like the first couple guys that get that kind of opportunity they took it with open arms so that's I think that's a sign of a strong squad and we can chuck that and like file that under the um, header of you know further things that advance the Welly next title quest prospects they do have the double banger on the the rest of this week so they're playing as you said Wednesday against Perth Glory and then Saturday 
they play Adelaide United, who are in mid-table. They're mid-table. So a couple of mid-table clashes, which presents a nice little juncture for us. We'll record our po- podcast early next week, and then we can reassess. We've got two games to two, two games against two mid-table teams that is going to offer a clearer assessment of the Wellington Phoenix Hurricane. Sydney FC are first. So this is going to put into context where the Wellington Phoenix are at over the next week or so. What is tickling your toes internationally wildcard with regards to our flying Kiwi footballers? Let's start in Europe and just offer a bit there and then we'll move over to the M. Oh, yes. Yeah, um, Chris Wood, I suppose, is the fella you gotta you gotta put a nice big spotlight on. There are a few others which flying Kiwis, if you read that tomorrow morning, you'll see like, for example, Ali Riley's got a bit, um, Hannah Wilkinson's got a bit. It might even be some sneaky Maddie Garbutt news after a few weeks. Um potentially some Joe Bell too. Like there's plenty of there's plenty of stuff going on on the old flying Kiwis beat, but Chris Wood is certainly the the headline act of this week. Um just a really like a really enjoyable week of Chris Wood kind of football as Burnley got a couple important wins which keeps them sort of in that mix. I don't think they're quite going to um, make the cut as far as European qualification goes, but they're certainly still in the mix with a couple games to go. In fact, they might only have one game to go now, actually. Um, I'd better, I'd better check on that bad boy. But um, uh, yeah, Burnley 37 games played. They're on 54 points. Um in ninth so they've got to get up two places to to make europa's most likely i don't think that's gonna uh, and even then that might not be the case if arsenal win the fa cup too so a little right like probably not gonna probably not gonna make the um europa league this time around they did a couple years ago and didn't much enjoy that experience but whatever uh, but you know chris wood being an important part for them um over the getting those two couple wins just making sure they finish on a on a good high note there uh, they beat, um, suppose I should whip this up so I'm not dumb and say the wrong thing here, but they beat Norwich most recently, and before that it was Wolves, I think. Um, it was, in fact, they didn't beat Wolves, they drew one all, that's right. They drew one all, They um, Chris Wood was should have scored a goal, missed a bit of an open sitter with about like two minutes into injury time. Um, with his team trailing 1-0, they're looking for that one big opportunity late on, they got it, and he missed it, but then two minutes later, another ball's whipped into the box, and he goes for a bicycle kick, Matt Doherty comes over, like, shielding his eyes from the flying boot of Chris Wood, coming straight for him, ball hits his hand, they award a penalty, VAR upholds it, a little bit harsh, uh, also one of the ones that Wellington Phoenix are probably looking at as evidence to send to the A-League this week, but... So it goes, Chris Wood steps up, pummels it into the top corner, an outstanding penalty, and just like um, Sean Dyche's coach afterwards was big on just like praising the mentality of the dude to miss a big chance late on and then to carry on, to help win a penalty, then most importantly to step up and emphatically score that penalty to get his team a valuable point there. And then a few days later, they played against Norwich, Norwich already relegated, not much to it, Norwich were... It's a weird game because Norwich didn't play badly, but they also had two red cards and were struggling with nine men against 11 for a lot of that. Um, and it was two first half red cards too, I'm pretty sure. Um, and it was only late in that first half when uh, when Chris Wood, like fifth minute of um, injury time it was, fifth minute of injury time Chris Wood pops up when a game where like Burnley had been struggling to break down a team they've been playing with... Um, Playing with 10 men since the 35th minute, and then just before he scored his goal, they had been reduced to 9. Um, ball across, and Chris Wood decides to go for a bit of a flop, just like he practiced the, um, the game before with a little... I wouldn't quite call it a bicycle kick. I think one of his legs was still on the ground. We'll call it an overhead kick, but he managed to put it down in the bottom corner. So um, much more acrobatically um, exciting, explosive than you'd necessarily expect from Chris Wood ordinarily, but... A lovely goal, one to add to his season highlight reel as he continues to tally up the goals. Uh, it was a late own goal as well that tipped that one to a 2 0 win for Burnley. Um, and yeah, Chris Wood just continues to continues to score goals. He played his hundredth Premier League appearance overall. 
Um, he's also obviously played, I think he played once for West Brom. I think he played nine times for Leicester. And now he's played 92 or 93, uh, something like that for, um, for Burnley. He scored 33, 34 goals, something in that range as well from, um, from his opportunities, just like leading the way, flying the flag, Chris Wood being Chris Wood. You gotta, you gotta love it when the woodsman gets in amongst the goals for sure. Now I've seen bits of the MLS on TV in New Zealand, bits of it. Like it's, it's interesting, but it, for me, it's like watching Super Rugby Australia. You know, I, I I'm bald, I'm up <laughs> it's to my. It's actually a really good analogy. I'm up to my neck in Super Rugby Aotearoa. I love it. I love the quality of the rugby. It's it's like rugby perfect for me. It's how I want rugby to be. And when I, when I yeah, I'm spoiled. So when I get a little less quality, specifically with rugby, it's, it's just, a, it, ugh, it just gets a bit, ugh. but when you're watching Super Rugby Aotearoa, it's like, holy cow, this is awesome. This is the rugby I love and have grown up loving. Flick on some MLS hear some Americans speaking, see that I can't see any Kiwis later, but so what, what's happening in the MLS with regards to our Kiwis? And is there anything of interest there? Like should Kiwi football fans be specifically tuning in to the MLS is back tournament, um, usually on ESPN in Aotearoa? MLS is back tournament is a terrible name for a tournament as well. Like it's, I, don't know what why don't you just come up with like a fancy noun or something like that or just name something i don't know the the um women's competition is called the nwsl challenge cup which at least that makes sense you know it sounds like an actual thing whereas the mls's back tournament is just i don't know but i have similar reservations about um about american soccer as you do i think i um i can watch it it's fine i'll what well, you know it's it's not a terrible brand of football it's often quite um you know flowing and interesting in that way i find elements of it just completely excruciating the commentary generally is part of that although they've normally got englishmen doing the commentaries it's not so much getting the loud american accents saying using weird phrases that no one else following the sport uses but um there, I don't know, there's just part of, elements of the MLS can be annoying sometimes, but at the same time, I also kind of love it as this as this hub of just like all whites talent in particular, where you've got, I mean, you've got like seven or eight guys at the moment registered with MLS clubs, not necessarily all playing because you've got a few of them who are sort of fringe roster dudes um, working their way up or... Um, like for example, Declan Wynn's been on the bench for Colorado. I don't think he's played much, and that's the that's the trick at the moment as far as this season, as far as like a guide to watching MLS as a New Zealand fan at the moment. Um, you're limited with your options because uh, yeah, Declan Wynn isn't going to play a whole lot. Um, he's sort of a backup guy there at Colorado. Um, Winston Reed at Sporting Kansas City been on the bench, but yet to actually see him play yet, which is a little bit frustrating because. I watched, they, they played um, against Minnesota in their first game, and I watched that one full 90 minutes, because um, obviously that's, Minnesota is, Minnesota is one of those, is the one team who, if they're playing and you're wanting to watch some Kiwis play, that's the one you turn on for sure, you, like, you don't skip over that one, um, but like, there's there's just there's no way Winston Reid, even after basically two years out of football, is worse than some of the players that were um, starting for Sporting Kansas City. Like there's no way he doesn't improve that team. If he's eighty percent fit, then he should be straight in there. So I uh, don't know what's going on there, but um, I'm sure he'll work his way. Like he's too good not to, so he'll work his way in as time. I guess they're just like playing it safe with him. Um, Elliot Collier is going to be on the bench most games for Chicago Fire, and he should get a few cameos as well. So you you might want to watch the last twenty odd minutes of a Chicago game. Um, I don't think we'll see much Kyle Adams for Houston. We you know he if there's an injury or a suspension, he comes into the mix. But at the moment, he's definitely sort of like a a lower roster sort of um, center back for them. Uh, but. Built to Iloma for Portland. I'm not entirely sure if they're going to consider him first eleven at the moment because they've made a few, they've like made one or two signings and at centre back, and they've got like a quite a bit of depth in that position. But he has done very well there in the past, so he's certainly going to be in every squad. 
Um, he started. He didn't start their first game. Came off the bench. He started their second game. So he's going to play more often than not, probably for for Portland. So that's one to watch. Um, the the big one is Minnesota United, where you've got Michael Boxall, James Musa, and Noah Billingsley. Uh, Billingsley is in that same sort of range as Kyle Adams just at the moment. He's you know first year professional. Um, Adams is an Adams has played a couple of years in the USL, but. Billingsley is coming straight in out of college through the draft. He's gonna take a little while, like it's gonna he's gonna have to wait till someone gets injured or whatever for his opportunity. But he is there knocking on the door, like breaking club fitness records and stuff as well in preseason. James Musa is gonna be sort of like the midfield defensive option off the bench, not gonna start unless it's a rotated lineup. But he is gonna be like if they're winning two 0 he's the guy they're gonna bring on. They did in fact against um, Sporting Kansas City in their first game. I don't think he played in the second. Whereas Michael Boxall is a first choice centre back, not only a first choice centre back for them, but he actually captained them with their with their regular captain and his regular uh, centre back partner. Not currently in um, wherever the hell it is that the MLS is basing themselves at the moment, he's not currently there. So Boxall's taken over um, captaincy duties as well. Just shows you what a high esteem he's held in at that club. Um, and he is the dude of all of these guys. Michael Boxall is the one who just like. Game after game, week after week, lays it down. Um, same deal last season. He was the standout Kiwi performer in the MLS. Will most likely be the same again this year. So Michael Boxall, Minnesota United, that's where you want to be if that happens to be on the tally. Anything else, maybe maybe don't need to worry too much about it. I should also mention the NWSL because it'll be the last time we mention it for a little while. Um, they're doing this... Um, yeah, this Challenge Cup thing, which is a very similar format to what MLS is doing. And I didn't mention anything about MLS results or standings or whatever because it's a bit too early to really for it to shake out yet. Um, they're just sort of try both of them trying to do like World Cup style things where you have a little group stage and then you go into knockouts and um, Abiosex North Carolina Courage absolutely cruise through four wins from four in the group stage, but then come the first game of the knockouts, first versus eight, they lost to the bottom place team. They um, dominated them. They had more than enough chances to have won that game 4-1, but they just didn't take their chances. The opposition keeper had a blinder. Sometimes it's just one of those days. As it happens, it's Portland as well. So Portland have been their biggest title rivals over the last few years. They hadn't won a game in the group stage, but I don't know how that happened because they're a strong team. They should have. I guess it just shows you that group stage shouldn't really matter a whole lot when everybody makes the knockouts. Keep that in mind for when we talk about the NPL later. Um, and yeah, so they lost 1-0 to Portland, so Abby Ursig was knocked out, having been outstanding on a, both the personal and a team level throughout that group stage, fell at the first hurdle in the, in the knockouts, and then um, Katie Bowen's Utah also lost in the quarterfinals on penalties, Rosie White's um, OL Reign also lost in the quarterfinals on penalties, both those games and little draws. Um, Rosie White didn't actually, uh, Katie Bowen came on at halftime, I think, and played out the rest of that game. Um, either came on at halftime or came off at halftime, I forget. She's done both of those throughout the season. Um, and Rosie White didn't play in the last few games for, for um, the rain, actually. She went off injured in about their second game, I think it was, and didn't actually, she was on the bench every game after that, but didn't actually play again after that, so... Uh, perhaps not 100%, perhaps might have been able to help them get a sneaky 1-0 result in that game. But yeah, no, as it worked out, bloody NWSL, which was so much fun, um, even like especially compared to the MLS as well, just sort of showing them up in terms of like the the quality, standard of play and everything that was coming back and getting Kiwis nice and involved, all three of them. Pretty Ellie Riley couldn't be there as well with her Orlando team not currently partaken because of uh well because they had some COVID outbreak but um and had to withdraw but you know the other three all got good minutes up until white got injured and then it's just like as soon as you get to the quarterfinals all three of them got knocked out within the space of two days so it was a pretty rotten weekend for the nwsl and we don't really need to focus on that again um until well we it's hoped that they'll be because the MLS is going to have a regular season after this and they're actually including the group stage games as part of the regular season standings like they're doubling up in that way I don't think that's the case with the knockouts they're sort of just like knockouts um, but the NWSL hasn't got anything like that so we don't actually know if there's going to be any more 2020 season you'd hope so because it's only July but nothing's scheduled at the moment um I think there were maybe some hints in the way that Ali Riley's gone on loan to 
Sweden that uh, they're hoping to be able to recall her if and when an actual NWSL regular season for 2020 eventuates. But um, yeah, nothing, nothing, uh, nothing official at this point. So we're not entirely sure what's going on there at the moment. We've just uh, lost our entire NWSL contingent all at once. So uh, guts for that one, I suppose. I don't like it. We'll slide over to the NRL. So we had a couple of interesting Kiwi NRL debuts. We had Jackson Polo for the Rabbitohs debuting on the wing. And we had Dejan Asi debuting in the halves for the Cowboys in a very interesting selection there. These Both of these players, Polo and Asi, were named... They had development contracts with either club. So every NRL team has a top 30, and then you're allowed up to six development contracts, which in a normal NRL season after June 30th, those development contracted players can then play in the NRL. But those development players cannot play NRL before June 30th. So, well, in this season... That was scratched, so those players can pop up anywhere. So just keep that in mind as as you hear stories about the Warriors needing loan players all over the show and wanting a loan player here, loan player there. Assuming the Warriors have some of their development contract players with them in Australia, they can use those younger players. And considering the state of their 2020 season, I would love to see someone like Paul Turner, who's a half with the Warriors, come through the Warriors system. He's from Northland. He's on a development contract at the moment. I'd like to see him play. Like, what's the point? You might as well just give some young players game time and experience at this juncture. But we are, we have already got a couple Kiwi NRL debuts. And uh, I think I noted... The Charlie Staines dude who debuted for the Penrith Panthers last week, he was a development player. Sio Sefa Talakai was on a development contract with the Cronulla Sharks, and the Raiders had Kai O'Donnell come into their team with Josh Hodgson out. He was also on a development contract. So a couple teams have re- resorted to their development players um, for whatever reason. Every club's in a slightly different scenario. Jackson Paulo played left wing for the Rabbitohs. He is from the North Shore. He's a North Coast Tigers junior, but moved to the Gold Coast pretty early on. And Jackson Paulo and Dejan Arce actually both played for Kibra Park. Not sure if it was at the same time, but they did enter Australia through Kibra Park. Well, not really, because they I think they went to Australia and then joined up with Kibra Park as opposed to being recruited to go to Kibra Park. Jackson Paulo is from Northcote Tigers. Dejan Asi is from Christchurch. He is a Aranui Eagles junior. And like Jackson Paulo, pretty good winger, tall, skillful, had a try assist with a little grubber. He actually had two grubbers on the wing. Both grubbers were done like mid-running. So pretty skillful by the looks of it. He's tall, he's athletic. He had a pretty nice running game. 18 runs, 165 meters. 71 post-contact meters, which was the second highest for any Rabbitohs player, the second highest post-contact meters. Granted, it did come off 18 runs, quite a high number of runs. So shout out Jackson Paulo. But as as far as like funk and interest goes, Dejan Arce is a bit more notable. He... Yeah, so he's from Christchurch, and then he spent time at Kiber Park, but he also spent time at, I think it was Brisbane Grammar School, where he played first 15 rugby. And then from there, I think he had a season with North's Devils, like under-19s or something, in Brisbane, and then he moved up to Townsville. So last season, he was playing under-20s for the Townsville Blackhawks in the Intra Super Cup. Oh, Queensland competition, sorry. The Queensland Hastings Daring Colts competition is under 20s. And Dejan Arce played a couple games there, but he also played a couple games in reserve grade for the Townsville Blackhawks at centre. And then 
2020, he is still 19 years old, and he's made his debut for the North Queensland Cowboys in the halves. So those are key indicators for me of a prodigious talent. Like, he's still under 19, so last year he would have been 18, playing in the under-20s and reserve grade. And then he joined the North Queensland Cowboys just on a train and trial deal. So he joined their NRL squad on a train and trial deal. Here he is making his debut in the halves. The other difference between those two players is Jackson Paulo kind of came through the New Zealand Rugby League pipeline. So while he was living in Gold Coast and part of the Gold Coast Titans junior system, he was recruited by the Rabbitohs midway through last season from the Titans. He was part of the Tota Hedi program, which was like a New Zealand rugby league program to a camp for players based in Australia, which I think there were two years of that, but it hasn't appeared since. Um, not sure why, but I'll hazard a guess that it was a bit of a waste of resource because a lot of the players had very loose connections to Aotearoa. So a lot of players spent time with the Tota Hedi camp, but have very little connection to New Zealand. Like they're either choosing Samoa or Tonga or even Australia over New Zealand. So that stopped. But Jackson Polo was in the in Totahiri for two years. Second year he played New Zealand under eighteens. So he's while being based in Australia, he has come through the New Zealand rugby league pipeline. Whereas Dejan Asi, I can't find him anywhere in New Zealand age group rep teams or junior Kiwis teams. So he's been a bit more undercover. And Dejan Asi was actually named in the Queensland emerging squad this summer. The summer just gone alongside guys like Tamaso Habai Fido, um, Fanatesi Nu, Tino Fa'amasuli. Those type of dudes are all in the Queensland emerging squad. So... Hopefully Dejan Asi goes the New Zealand. They're both also Samoan, so they could be eligible for Samoa. Hopefully Dejan Asi does come the Kiwis route because he is in that Queensland emerging squad. So um, that's something to watch out for moving forward, just the eligibility. Um, Jackson Polo did have a try assist in that game, and Dejan Asi had a try in the halves for the Cowboys, like got the ball, bounced off his left foot and then just got shot through a cannon straight through the try line. And when I'm thinking about Dejan Arce, I'm thinking about Kiwi's halves once again, like you've got so many young halves. He was playing against Jerome Luai. Luai's a former junior Kiwi's captain and I've kind of lost interest in Luai because I just think he's going to stick with Samoa um, and keep playing for Samoa. But Michael Maguire is really smart he's onto it he knows all the players who are eligible he's across all kiwis matters and a good kiwis team makes it more attractive for someone like luai to play for the kiwis but regardless like there's a lot of kiwi eligible halves in the nrl right now like dylan brown's fantastic for the eels you got jerome hughes with the melbourne storm i believe yeah. Uh, try assist so you got Sean Johnson's leading all try assists still with 15 then you've got Jerome Hughes in fourth with try assists as well Jerome Lawai is 12th with twi with try assists let alone all the good work Dylan Brown's doing so I say all that because Arcee looks good he looks good and, and even more he's only really played like center or come off the bench for when he's playing for Townsville Blackhawks so he I he just appeared out of nowhere to make his NRL debut as a starting half. He is a left-sided player, so he's kind of stuck on the left edge. Um, but we did see many promising signs from him, specifically with the try he scored, but also just his involvements and how busy he was. I'll just offer a couple of stats here. Did a fair amount of kicking, which was good to see. As far as touches of the footy goes... Arcee had 34 touches of the footy, and Jake Clifford, the other Cowboys half, he had 39 touches of the footy, so that was split nice and evenly. And Arcee finished with 9 kicks, and Clifford had 12 kicks. So, again, pretty even split as far as uh, busyness goes for those two halves. 
and it's it's awesome. Awesome to see two young Kiwi and RL players getting their debut pretty much out of nowhere, um, considering neither was in the top 30 squad for their respective teams. And I will also say that the Cowboys have a couple more. They've got someone like Emery Perry from the Waikato region. He's a big middle forward in their wider group. They've got someone like Griffin Niami, who's from Greymouth. He played for the Junior Kiwis, the under-19 Junior Kiwis last year. He's really good. They've got someone named Witamu Gregg, who is from Northland. He's in their system as well. So a couple of Kiwi NRL juniors coming through the Cowboys. And Arcee made his debut in this game. Connolly Lamelu made his debut earlier in the season. So they've already given out two Kiwi NRL debuts as well. So those are really interesting debuts for a couple of young Kiwi NRL players. And that was pretty much the best thing from the weekend's footy at Wildcard. Yeah, tell you what, you... um. You raised a rather interesting point in there, one that we've discussed uh, once or twice before as well, about like just the growing depth in, in these Kiwi NRO halves. And for the best, like the better part of a decade, we've been looking at um, Kiwi's half pairings where you've got like uh, some combination of Sean Johnson, Karen Foran, and Benji Marshall. And all three of those are outstanding players. So. Um, Nothing on that, but just it's it's lovely to have the depth as well because I, I can think um, didn't Tohu Harris play a game in the house for the Kiwis once, and there's been like one or two other similar, or Peter Hiku might have at some point as well. Like it's uh, it's just lovely to have a fair bit of depth, and it does make me wonder. And I guess you're the person to ask is like is how like how are we looking for? Um, I don't know if there's going to be international football this year or not. Hopefully there will be. So but like how are we looking in other positions as well in terms of just like that expanding depth and guys just putting themselves on the, like, not just up-and-comers, but we're talking, like, guys who immediately right now are in contention for Kiwis nods and stuff like that. Like, how are we, how are we looking in that regard? We're looking so good wildcard that if Karen Foran never plays 40 again, it's all good. Like, the the reason Toe Harris, the reason Peter Hickey, the reason Isaac John, all these dudes were playing in the halves, for the Kiwis is because if like Foran was often injured and then Benji Marshall was off the radar and it's just Sean Johnson whereas now if you take Benji Marshall out like he shouldn't be taken out he should be a leader and a key point in this whole discussion is Michael Maguire because there was an interview he did with the New Zealand Herald on the weekend and he it was a very simple interview but he just like laid out some key ideas with regards to the Kiwis and he is a very smart operator like I don't envy his job because he's trying to coach the Tigers and be across all Kiwis matters at the same time which is bonkers but he was saying like um, watching Super League games being across players in the Super League as well building around a leadership core like you've got um Jesse Bromwich, Jared Wadea Hargrave, Sean Johnson, Dallin Watane Lesniak, Roger Tuivasa Shek, those kind of guys are the core. But then he's also talking about every player who comes into the Kiwis is a leader. And an idea like that also packaged with an idea of the Kiwis being a winning footy team. They're here to win games. And that and those those ideas are very basic, but brief insight into the mind of Michael Maguire and what he's up to with the Kiwis. And so when we're talking about this, like, it's very exciting from a talent standpoint, but also just having a smart operator at the top is also very exciting, considering where we come from with the World Cup and all that shit. Um, but I got to that point because of the Benji Marshall factor. Benji Marshall and Michael Maguire, they're together at the Cowboys, great relationship. Michael Maguire, as I laid out, very knowledgeable of the importance of leadership, and understanding the the values of New Zealand and Aotearoa Kiwis, the cultural significance as well. So Benji Marshall, with that in mind, should be in the Kiwis setup more often than not, let alone every single time. So I don't think like it's a matter of I said take Benji Marshall out, but I don't think that's the case. But like just from a pure talent standpoint, if Benji Marshall isn't playing and Kieran Foran's pretty much a walking injury at this point, like, respect to Kieran Foran, but that's just what it is. 
you've got Dylan Brown, you've got Jerome Hughes. Like those are the two next halves, and I think Dylan Brown is right there. Dylan Brown will make his Kiwis debut this year for certain, like for sure. Assuming the Kiwis play some uh, internationals at the end of this year, Dylan Brown is going to be in the halves. This kid is very, very legit. Um, let me just pull up that Manly Seagulls versus Eels game. Um, the Eels lost that game, but Dylan Brown, what we're looking for with Dylan Brown is his running ability. This dude runs the footy at like just will. 16 runs for 174 meters, 64 post contact meters. Anything. Like, if you've got a half with 50-plus post-contact meters, holy shizer. But that's just because of his, you know, footwork. He's pretty big. Like, he's, I think he's 182, 185 centimeters tall. He had four tackle busts versus Manly Seagulls. 63 touches of the footy. Now, remember what I said about Dejan Asi. He had 34 touches of the footy as a half. Dylan Brown had 63 touches of the footy as a half. No Mitchell Moses, but that's the control that Dylan Brown is working with. And compare that to like Clint Gutherson, great fullback, always on the ball, 38 touches. So Dylan Brown is running the Eels at the moment. And he's a good defender, doesn't miss too many tackles, 17 kicks, so he did all the Eels kicking as well. So someone like Dylan Brown is right there, uh, Highly likely to make his Kiwis debut this season. I think Jerome Hughes has a bit more versatility. And last year we saw Jerome Hughes come off the bench to play dummy half. And if I'm pondering like a top 17, Danny Levi is alright for the Manly Seagulls. Brandon Smith is starting at prop for the Melbourne Storm. Holy shit. Um, but he's going to be the Kiwis starting dummy half. So then it just met, like you can use Jerome Hughes off the bench in a utility role and have Sean Johnson, Dylan Brown in the halves, Brandon Smith starting at hooker. Or you just have Danny Levi on the bench, whatever. But just as far as pure footballing talent goes, I want Jerome Hughes in the team. And he's got that utility history with Michael Maguire and the Kiwis setup. So that's the playmaking situation right now. And it's like, Okay, no Kieran Foran, that's a bit of a bummer. Uh, like, if we're talking the strongest possible Kiwis team, you're still probably looking at Sean Johnson and Kieran Foran. But Kieran Foran doesn't have the best ability, which is availability on his side, so that's working against him. So then it's like Sean Johnson, Dylan Brown in the halves, Brandon Smith at hooker, Jerome Hughes coming off the bench. Woo-wee! That, that sounds good, doesn't it, Walker? It sounds outstanding. Um, I was watching the... Uh, happy to admit I didn't watch hardly any of the Warriors game this weekend, but I did watch the Dragons-Bulldogs game and Karen Foran was playing in that and Karen Foran went off injured and um, that was a weird one because he... Like, the Dragons were absolutely brilliant for the first 10 minutes and then as bad as it's possible to be for the next 30, I was, like, pulling my hair out watching this team just make mistake after mistake. Like, literally set after set after set, there was something dumb happening that was avoidable, a penalty conceded or whatever, but it actually all started, I think, like, the swing in momentum after the Dragon shot out to a 10-0 lead was a, um, a fantastic kick from Karen Foran, which, like, from about 60, like, kicked at about 60 metres, it held up right in the end goal, um, uh, the Bulldogs managed to get a repeat set after it with a good kick chase and um, that kind of swung the game in a way but then Kieran Foran went off injured and then I think he had a head check and then but then he didn't he came back out sat on the bench after half um, time and I don't think he actually got back out in the field again if he did it was a bit later on I, I'm pretty sure he didn't but it was a weird one with Kieran Foran because he was like there were glimpses of everything you know about the dude. Like he, it was a fantastic kick. There was some good controlling halves play, and then there was an injury, which meant he couldn't see the game out. It's like, well, that's Karen Foran for you, isn't it? And of course, Dragons came back and won that one late with a couple, of, um, you know, late tries on that one. So it didn't, you know, maybe that's that's Karen Foran in a nutshell, I guess you could say. But I wouldn't even be surprised. Like I, we may maybe we're a year away from this being 
realistic, but I wouldn't even be surprised to say, like, I'm, I'm kind of tempted to say I think Dylan Brown might be ahead of him now already. But, uh, yeah, like I said, maybe that's a year away, um, that, that from being, like, an actual fact. But, yeah. Any other breakout players, just in other positions as well? So, while we're on the topic? Just on that Dylan Brown thing, like, straight up, right now, Dylan Brown's a better player. But in the context of a Kiwis team, it's a very young Kiwis group as well. And, like, just, like, to switch it back to that Bulldogs-Dragons game, the Bulldogs might not have got back into that game if Kieran Froman was playing, because they did pretty well when he wasn't playing. You mentioned the kick he did. Like, he kind of started it, but um, we're just dealing with what actually happened, not a fantasy reality. Just got to point that out. So the Bulldogs, if Kieran Form was playing, the Bulldogs may not have been in that position. However, at the end of that game, if Kieran Foran's playing, the Bulldogs win because they just fucked it up. Like <laughs> it was, it was, it was kind of comical how the Bulldogs messed up that that the chance to win that game. Obviously, very low in confidence. Their club's in absolute shambles. Their club is. Example A and how not to run a football club just with all the noise in the boardroom and their little, you know, disputes and all that impacts what you see on the footy field on the weekend. But I use that example because like if you're, we're looking at a Kiwis team where everyone's a bit younger. So in the centres, you've got Joey Manu, you've got Isan Masters, maybe you've got Nicol Klockstad. On the wings, you've got Mamalo, you've got... Um, I'm having a blank on the other, like, oh, Watson is the Like, these dudes are, yeah, there's a bit of experience, but they're all younger guys. So in the Kiwis team, having Sean Johnson and Kieran Foran steering the team around and controlling a game, I think it's a better situation. But head to head, Dylan Brown's a far better player right now for the Eels, doing what he does every single week. Um... And I'll just try and look for some more stats just with what he's doing, running the footy and stuff like that. Um, the other young players... Oh wait, so Dylan Brown is 12th in tackle bus, which is pretty good. Don't mind that. And he is 19th in total line breaks. So he's top 20 in tackle bus and line breaks. Package that with Sean Johnson being first in try assists. That's a pretty nice combo, Wildcard. Well, pretty nice combo. But the... It's, uh, and I'm having a lot of positive thoughts thinking about, you know, the playmakers, the halves, the young players coming through. Dejan Asi just popped out of nowhere to be a factor in an NRL game as a 19-year-old. Like, that's all cool. If you're a Kiwis fan and that hasn't got you excited to see the Kiwis play footy just yet, Wildcard, well, it's all about the forwards. <laughs> the 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 options available to the Kiwis as as a Ford pack is crazy. It's cra it's absolutely crazy. Like I think the best Kiwis Ford pack again just with experience and steadiness, the best like starting middle trio, you're still looking Jesse Bromwich, Wadea Hargraves and James Fisher Harris. James Fisher Harris is pretty much top five in all running stats. Post contact meters, he's third, um, and all of this is related because if t if you're taking the most runs, you're going to be making the most meters, but you got to do the job. All runs, he's fourth. Total run meters, he's third. Like James Fisher, Fisher Harris is shining in the NRL right now, so I think he starts alongside Wade Our Hargraves, alongside Jesse Bromwich. Like you need that mana, you need that leadership in an international forward pack. But then you're looking at like guys coming off the bench or other guys just playing a role. And you're looking at Nelson Asafa Solomon, Marata Niakori, Braden Hamlin Ueli, Josh Alawai. Like these dudes are doing an exceptional job week in, week out in the NRL, let alone other dudes. Isaac Liu's pretty good for the Roosters. And these are just dudes who I'm fairly confident are going to be uh, eligible for the Kiwis because like someone like Satili Tupanuya is probably going to lean towards Tonga. Uh, Moiaki Fatuaika is probably going to lean towards representing Tonga. 
we know Tokyaho, Tamalolo, those dudes are representing Tonga. So this is just dudes who I think are likely to be available for the Kiwis um, in their next, next crop of games. Even on the edges, Britain Nakora, pretty damn good himself. Tohu Harris hasn't played Kiwis footy in a long time. So if he wants to play, that's all good. He's fantastic. Kenny Bromwich is playing week in, week out, 80 minutes on the edge for the one of the best teams in the NRL, Melbourne Storm. <sighs> that group of forwards, Braden Hamlin Ueli, Asafa Solomona, Marata Niokori, Josh Alawale, like these dudes are very good middle forwards in the 2020 version of NRL footy. And I think we're in for a bit of a Kiwis revolution here, Wildcard. Like, I talked up the golden era of all Kiwi footballing matters. We're right there. We're right there with the Kiwis as well. Well, what a lovely thought. That's that's some like uh, golden sunshine kind of, uh, what do you call that thing, horizon that we're walking towards then. Um, and I, I can't disagree either because I, I watch a lot of NRL every week and I see like over and over every game has like a dominant Kiwi player, if not 10. You know, like it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful times that we live in. And I love that quote you mentioned as well. I was just thinking of that again while you mentioned something that that quote you mentioned earlier on from uh, Michael Maguire about how every Kiwis player is a leader. And I'm like, yeah, that's uh, if you can get to that point, then you've got a you've got a strong culture and a strong team in place if you can get to that because international sport you should be right you should like you sh the best players should be in that thing and the best players are going to be standouts for their clubs if you're a standout for your club you should be a leader off the park as well as on the park um, every personality is different so different people have different versions of what leadership means to them and how it's uh, reflected in their character but in their own way every one of those players should be a leader and if you can pick a team with that in mind that's yeah that one stuck with me yeah that that's one i'm sort of um th that's one that might continue to stick with me as well i quite like that quote and it's also a case of building something that is attractive because a lot of you know unless you're maori or pakia you're going to have dual eligibility and even if you are maori or pakia like you might be a maori who moved to australia at a young age like all these situations are so common less to a lesser extent with Australian players because, you know, they're not migrating from another country to Australia, whereas a lot of Kiwi players migrate across the ditch for family reasons at a young age. So they're eligible for, you know, 20 different national international teams. So it's, yeah, you're always going to have, you know, Māori and Pākehā players available, but the reason, like, uh, there's a bunch of reasons one being, you know, Tongans are very, very proud of their Tongan culture and Tongan heritage. But uh, I'd suggest a significant reason for a lot of the, you know, Tongan players going to represent Tonga was they felt some disconnect or they felt a greater a disconnect with the Kiwis camp under David Kidwell. And they also felt a greater attraction to the Tongan uh, setup. So part of Michael Maguire's job now you're going to have you know players who are surplus to Kiwi's requirement and those players will go on to represent Samoa and Tonga but and that's fantastic like we want the strongest Samoan team we want the strongest Tongan team whether they are Australian Samoans or Kiwi Samoans or just Samoans straight from the islands whatever they are we want the strongest teams but if you're Michael Maguire and you're in charge of the Kiwis setup your job is to make the Kiwis the most attractive team because your that's your job your job is to have the strongest possible Kiwis team and so you can kind of like look at player eligibility and player availability as a reflection of the team and the culture and that's driven by the coach so what happened prior to the last World Cup, you had a lot of players leave. And that was a reflection of the the Kidwell culture and the Kiwis. So it was a direct reflection of that. Whereas under Michael Maguire, you get a completely different vibe. And we're gonna see, you know, what what that what manifests from that. You know, what is are you gonna have a more are you going to have younger players who are eligible for 
different teams choosing the Kiwis because of the the vibe, the atmosphere in the Kiwis and everything available there based on what Michael Maguire is building. So very interesting. Very interesting indeed, Wildcat. Certainly is. Um, as is the NBL at the moment. Shall we swing over onto onto some of their matters as well while we've still got a little bit of time in the podcast? Although we believe we're just going to do the one this week and maybe make that more of a norm. So we're going to just go hard on Mondays and uh, cover as much as we possibly can. But um, yeah, the NBL is... There's um, obviously no games on Mondays, so we're at a nice little juncture at the moment where we're four weeks down, one week to go, and then after this coming week, we have the finals. So uh, what does that mean? Two games a day, that means uh, two, four, six, and then three games on Saturday. Uh, so nine games remaining in the regular season. Um, uh, you got Manawatu Jets, Otago Nuggets, and Taranaki Mountaineers all on seven wins. The Mountaineers have played one extra game. Um, everyone's played either 11 or 12, so it's all still pretty close. You do have Nelson at um, four and eight, a little bit of a distance between them and the two six win teams, um, the Bulls and Huskies. The Rams are on three and nine, so having started three and oh, and they've just been. A tricky team to watch, eh? Because they look so good. Um, the Rams at times, uh, when they get like when they've got Taylor Britt just gone running downhill, and when um they've added uh, Ruben Tarangi as well, which is as good of a mid-season injury replacement as you can possibly get. But they've just had so many injuries; it's been hard for them to to roll through that. But even then, there's been a couple bad beats and um. The end of games there, eh, where they have they've had an opportunity to win and they haven't been able to close it out. So it's tough for them, but um due to the way the format works, it doesn't really matter. Like I did drop that hint earlier in the podcast. There's a it does like it does matter where you finish, where you get your seating. Um the playoffs are scheduled in a way to where like um you think of it sort of like quarterfinals, but the top few teams, because there's only seven teams, the top few teams are going to get an extra life, and it's not necessarily first versus last and whatever. Um, in fact, I'll sort of break that down. The Where are we? The first day of the playoffs, you have sixth versus seventh and first versus second. Um, sixth versus seventh is a straight knockout game, so at the moment that's looking very likely to be Nelson versus Canterbury, the Giants versus the Rams. Um, whoever, and oh, shout out to Mika Vakona as well, who popped up, made his first, um, appearance of the, of the season, um, couple, uh, was it yesterday or the game before? I forget. I think it was yesterday. Um, having, yes, to come in, had to do some quarantine and then he got sick for a while and couldn't play. And yeah, it was a bit of an awkward one for the Giants. It's not a coincidence that the, um, Giants and Rams are at the bottom and they're the two teams who have had... Very, very limited access to their first round picks. But yeah, sick first seven, straight elimination. The winner of that um, will then go on to face. What do they do after that? They face the um, third place team. Whoever. So sixth versus seventh, whoever loses is out. Whoever wins goes on to place face off against third place. And then that's an elimination game as well. Um, meanwhile, first versus second, the winner of that goes um and where, where are we qualifying final one qualifying final one will then go straight through to the semi-finals where they'll face uh one of the one of the elimination final second round thing it's a, a this is probably not going to work explaining it on the podcast uh, how it works but um you might have to look at the actual sort of like bracket how it goes but you but hopefully that's enough to at least get like a an inclination about how um, you know, the top few teams will get second lives and it's all like knockout stuff if you're at the very bottom, but it is sort of shuffled and arranged like it's not all on the same tier, how this um, sort of playoff system will work and everyone makes the playoffs. So ultimately, like, this is the week you want to start peaking. Like, um, all the stuff that's gone before, it's nice. Like, some teams have shown great form, some teams have been up and down, um, but now is really when you want to start, like, actually getting into a sprint because once you get to the playoffs it gets uh, it gets a little bit funky and it gets a little bit weird and those teams at the you know outside the first couple places in particular don't have a lot of wiggle room and we've just seen in a different version of this but what we were talking about earlier with the NWSL football stuff in America where like Abby Ursig's team 
were first place after the group stage and then lost their quarterfinal and now suddenly they're out. Like they were perfect up until the point where they weren't perfect anymore and now their entire tournament's over. Like it can be it can be a tricky one a tricky one like that and I think these um the the way these seedings work will be interesting to see just how much teams put like a uh, pressure on that kind of thing. Like do we see like um uh Franklin for example going crazy to try win all their remaining games and really like um really going hard at it because they want to get a first to like first or second seed or um do we see teams maybe settle knowing that everyone makes the playoffs and it's sort of as long as you back yourself to win a knockout game you can you can afford to finish fourth or fifth or whatever so it'll be interesting to see how teams really approach that and how desperate they get but um, yeah, this is a time when when this uh, tournament, which has been very, very entertaining up until this point, really starts to have some context beyond just like most of the time we've talked about it. We've talked about players and guys who are um, impressing and it's been like incredible to watch. Honestly, some of the young dudes coming through and some of the dudes who are a little older than young, but just haven't had the opportunities and wouldn't have normally gotten the opportunities in a league like this, just dominating the show. Um, with the spotlight on them and that's been great but this is like from this week onwards we start to get like the team context and the competition context and the championship context and that's just a whole other sort of wrinkle to this um to this nbl showdown which is going to be pretty fun and funky which team do you reckon is best positioned at the start of this week to not win the whole thing we'll assess that when the we get closer to the playoffs but just you know have a good week and generate some momentum maybe with players coming back or players being available i'm looking at the bro hiram harris and he's going all right there for the one or two team isn't he wildcard yeah man came back from he'd missed uh, several games with injury um, and then he comes back in against, uh, what was the game last night? Um, against the Taran Taranaki Mountaineers. So those are two of your top teams, if not the two top teams. Um, they were the two teams I've sort of, the last week or two, I've had sort of on my radar as I think these are probably your two teams to beat. Though I'm, I'm impressed by what Franklin can do, but I just think that Manawatu and Taranaki, even the Huskies actually, I think the Huskies are making a, an impressive late run, and they're one of those teams who are going to be proof in the pudding one way or another about whether the um, whether the seedings actually work, because I don't think well, they, they might be able to make a run. I mean, they're only one win off first, even though they're down in fifth, but it's just short season, and a lot of, like, no one team has run away with it. Talent's all spread out, so you never quite know. Um, the Huskies have the capability to really um, blow a team away if they if they click, but I think the Jets and the Mountaineers are probably the two teams I would back the highest. Hiram Harris coming back in in that game and getting a triple double, the first triple double that we've seen in this NBL showdown. So that was pretty bloody, um, you know, highlight real stuff right there from him. And if if he can have that kind of impact, then it's pretty pretty scary what old Manawatu might be able to do because you've also got Tom Vodanovich knocking them down. Tane Samuel's been great. Jaden Bazant. Um, I still think I would fall, even though the Jets just beat them um, by 15 points. I think I'd still lean overall competition-wise to, to the airs because I just think that that one-two combination of Daron Rokawa and Marcel Jones is going to win you a lot of close games and close games are what you see in and um and knockout elimination basketball so i think that's still where i would be um where i would still uh lean my pick towards but it's that's the thing with this competition and the structure about it is that honestly like the seventh place team could go on a run and win the whole thing it's not really any necessary like pattern or or expectation to it it could honestly go any way but yeah in terms of form teams in terms of just looking at the rosters who I think could win um, a bunch of consecutive knockout basketball games. I think I think Manawatu and Taranaki remain your your two favourites, and I think I'd just nudge Taranaki there on that one. You mentioned the Huskies there, Wilka, the Auckland Huskies, and it was a slow start for them, but I actually wrote about, what's his face, Isaiah Moriahu'u Leafa in the email newsletter this morning just because I saw him in the in the top 10 for average points and average assists he's 
seventh in average points, averaging 18.9 points, and he's third in average assists as well for a young dude. He spent four years at Sacramento State, so he's another one of these guys who has uh, come back from college basketball and done a really good job. He's also got the most, the highest average steals per game, 3.3. He's the only player to have to average over three steals. But then you've also got Tane Murray, so the two two best scorers for the Auckland Huskies are two really young dudes, and they're right there, mid-table, two points off the top three teams. If the Auckland Huskies do anything in like the, the playoffs or just the remainder of the NBL, it's going to be based off these young dudes flexing all over the NBL. And, you know, we've mentioned a lot of young dudes. We've mentioned Hiram Harris. We've mentioned old uh, Britt. We've mentioned Davidson. We've mentioned all these guys. But there's a couple of the Auckland Huskies who, are, who appear to be really slick. And just thinking back to talking about the Auckland Huskies a few weeks ago, like they've come a long way during the course of this tournament. And that is led by Mario Ho'u, Liafa, and Tane Murray as well. Yeah, a little bit of bad news on that one, though, because Tane Murray did injure his hand, so he's not going to play the rest of the tournament. Oh. So that's a sneaky big blow for them. Um, the Alpha missed a lot of the start as well. It was when those two, because he came back from overseas, he had to do a bit of quarantine. And I think the Huskies, because Kevin Braswell, their coach, had to do had to like quarantine himself as well because he was coming back from overseas too. So... Uh, it was a, a tricky one for them. I think that's a lot of why, like, they're also an expansion team. And, um, I mean, so a completely new roster. Everyone had new rosters because of the draft. But some teams were at least drafting, like, a lot of pre-selections and stuff like that. The Huskies just had the hardest um, path at the start because not only did they have at least one key player and, and um, like, unavailable to train with the team at the very start, but even their coach was in the same boat. So tricky stuff for them. Um there's still a team, even without Tane Murray, I think there's still a team if someone like Liafa can really get going. And they've got, like, um, Toy Smith Milner's there as well, so isn't he? So, like, they've got the ability. Um, it's no, like, they can, without Tane Murray, they can still make a good old run in the in the playoffs there. But, um, yeah, it's, yeah it's, every team's had their issues, um, haven't they, with various things as well. That's another reason why I think um, Taranaki still my slight favorites is because they've been as cons probably the most consistent of all of them just in getting like good performances from their best players and those best players being available over and over and uh, yeah we don't know how the playoffs will go though so it goes Liafa was on the um short list of I think it was five players that I wrote about um last week talking about sort of like this just this trend of guys coming back from college, like who have done the college thing, who've finished college, um, not in line to do like draft workouts or whatever for the NBA. A few of them weren't even at, like a couple of them were talking about Div 2 colleges and stuff like that as well. Um, but guys who are like, you know, solid, good, like certainly for the NBL level, top level players at that level for sure. And we've seen that, like... um uh isaiah marihuhu leafa is one of them um jordan hans at otago um jaden bizantz manu two um isaac davidson at franklin um oh who was the other one that i had there as well i I'm having a mind blank now but i forget um anyway there's like there's that nice little trend of dudes there as well there's also this trend of like um there's three or four kind of um fellas who are coming back from because obviously nbl free agency is starting now the breakers made a couple uh, one fantastic signing a couple semi-interesting signings not quite as fantastic but um we'll see how that goes well, you gotta wait and see the end of free agency anyway to see the full roster coming together but um there are a couple like taylor brett as a was a um uh, development player with Perth last year he I saw in an interview with him he's had some discussions with Perth about hopefully going back as well which would be great for him um and I'm I mean yeah I I don't know 
hopefully there's a couple spots on the breakers roster for some of these guys, like some of these guys that are pushing through. I also hope though, that it's not just the breakers. I would, because of what we've seen, like Hiram Harris is another one who's and Ty Winyard as well, done development player stints in the NBL last season. Um, like I, I would hope that some of those Aussie NBL teams are taking a good hard look as well at some of these players and, and like some of the talent that's on show. Cause there's certainly guys who can make that step up if they get a little bit of, a little bit of, you know, trust and belief and guidance and all those things. But, um, Liafa is one who I've just had a, a I still think it's a bit of an awkward one that the breakers let Shaley go. And I think he's a dude who could have contributed a lot to them and I see shades of Shaili in the way that um, Isaiah Liafa plays. So I, I, don't, I think the Breakers could do a lot worse than sign up a fella like that. Although I, I don't know if they will or not. I'm not actually completely sure what they're doing with their free agency plans based on what we've seen so far. But um, yeah, I, I will say like, because I did write also about that last week. And it's a little frustrating to see like it's, there's a development dude that they've signed on a three-year deal first year development um aussie fella who's like that guy could have got a uh, he seems like a very good player um galloway um but he also was surprised that he came here and not to an australian club it seems like they went out of their way to make themselves look to to like recruit a dude like that but at the same time it's like you didn't have a kiwi development player last year and you might not have one this year and i, I don't know it's it's a little bit frustrating on that matter but then the flip side of that is you also have to look at the breakers roster and say well they don't necessarily have like that home of up and coming dudes like they once did where there was always like a year after year there were three top tier like um kiwi prospects as development players on that roster Perhaps that's not a trend we're seeing under current ownership, but you also do have to applaud the fact that there is like something close to a top strength Tall Blacks starting lineup, basically just minus Isaac Fotu, um, who they did try and sign as well, but weren't able to, who are, um, you know, top tier um, Tall Blacks talents who are all signed up to that team as well. We've got like Abercrombie, the two Websters now, um, Finn Delaney, Rob Lowe, like you've got a, you've got a very strong top tier kiwi basketball presence there even if the development side of things isn't quite at the same level anymore Kawabunga. we wrap it up there wildcat and we'll let that all sink in we'll be up to our usual antics during the week email would be in your email boxes if you signed up already comes out monday and then another one coming out friday we'll be writing all sorts of stuff during the week as well so Keep an eye on for that. Otherwise, kia kaha, stay beautiful, and then just enjoy the sport around Aotearoa in the most wholesome, beautiful way. Cha-cha.